Tonight's program is brought to you in part by Lily. Welcome and thank you for attending. SAA Storytellers, Your Stories on Stage is a virtual community storytelling show that is an extension of the community stories featured in our quarterly news magazine, Spondylitis Plus. A special thank you to our sponsor, Lily, who has helped make this space possible. The stories tonight are presented pre-recorded, but we are gathering live tonight to celebrate the Spondylitis community and the healing power of story. Tonight's storytellers are Jane Morrill, Zainab Abul Hassan, Juliana Coughlin, Denise Roy, and Mary Cork. Please, please post comments before, during, or after the stories. Since our founding in 1983, the Spondylitis Association of America has been the face, the voice, and leading nationwide nonprofit organization educating, empowering, and advocating for people living with spondyloarthritis. Our mission is to be a leader in the quest to cure ankylosing spondylitis and related diseases and to empower those affected to live their lives to the fullest. SAA has many resources. Just click on the link in the chat to learn more. Okay, so let's get started. Our first storyteller tonight is Jane Morrill. Jane was born and raised in Calgary, Canada. She met her husband while at college in Maine. They moved to Portland, Oregon where they raised their boys, and where Jane went to the Oregon Culinary Institute. After working in professional kitchens, developing recipes, and representing wineries across Oregon, she moved to China for a year to teach Western culinary techniques to university students. Since retirement, she and her husband continue to enjoy the foodie culture in Portland and camping whenever they get the chance. Jane is delighted you are listening to her story, so let's hear it. My story begins years ago before I had a diagnosis of radiographic axial spondyloarthritis when it was called ankylosing spondylitis or AS and women didn't really get it before I knew what AS or a rheumatologist was. When I proudly held the title of family hypochondriac because of my aches and pains way back. I'm a young mother having trouble walking despite numerous trips to the physical therapist to fix my tight piriformis muscle, which runs through your butt to your hip. I don't know it yet, but it's actually my zigzaggy sacroiliac joint. We have them on either side of our lower back. For a joint that doesn't move much, it sure can cause a lot of trouble. My massage therapist has been unable to help. She says I should see a doctor because I should be showing at least some improvement. I'm bewildered. Why have I had back trouble since college? Why does my thumb hurt? Why are my heels sore and my Achilles tendons on fire? What is this betrayal? I'm having a tough time. <sighs> Raising three kids with mobility issues and pain like a knife cutting into my rear is no picnic, especially since I don't know why things hurt. My story begins one night when my third child is just a few months old and I find myself upside down on his bedroom floor after dark, him latched on nursing, pure contentment on his face. Yes, I'm upside down. The other boys are tucked into bed in dreamland. I'm rocking my baby in the hard wooden rocking chair, pushing with my left foot because my right foot is attached to the leg with the malfunctioning piriformis muscle, and it hurts. How many of you with sacroiliitis know what I'm talking about? The house is quiet, and I can hear the creak out back. My husband is watching sports. I hear muted sounds of cheering and announcers calling out scores. My son is making cute little baby nursing sounds. Then my left leg twitches, strongly enough to send the rocking chair back to the end of its range. I fear I'm gonna go all the way over and it's gonna hurt when I land. So I tense and wince in an 
anticipation. My whole body is tight. And I go over. I'm on my back. Slippers in the air. Nightgown around my face. Time stands still. I hold my breath, waiting for the stabbing pain to hit my pelvis. And it doesn't. I'm both horrified and relieved. I have felt sacroiliac pain before. In my quest to stop what is happening in an uncooperative body, I explore many solutions from homeopathy to capsaicin cream. This is a chili pepper extract that runs if you sweat. Sweat runs downward. It's not good, if you know what I mean. I have the older boys walk on my tight mid back to make it pop for temporary relief. In the bowels of the hospital, they inject me with something that I suspect is radioactive because it says nuclear medicine on the door. I have my sacroiliac joint aspirated to see if I have a bone infection. What's an aspiration? It's when they put a needle into your joint and they suck out a little bit of fluid to analyze. The problem is I don't think I have any fluid in my sacroiliac joints. The surgeon has me lying on the table, applies a local, and even though I've taken painkillers in anticipation, the experience makes me levitate, making natural childbirth seem trivial in comparison. The doctor asks, I'm sorry, are you feeling some discomfort? <laughs> Discomfort? How does one even describe something on this scale? The sound of the creek draws me back. I'm still upside down. Help! No answer. My son continues to nurse, oblivious. I'm invisible. I start to roll over, but my SI joint strongly objects. Ouch! Best just to lie still. <sighs> At least my feet are warm and the room is carpeted. In fact, it's, it's kind of cozy. <laughs> After an eternity, the cheering down the hall stops. I had, the game is over. Hubby's heading to bed, so he pops his head in to check on baby before closing up for the night. And then he sees us both entangled and his jaw drops. He says, are you okay? He rushes over, puts the happy baby back in the crib and hoists me up quickly enough to move me through the pain and onto my feet. It's hilarious and humiliating. I want to be seen, but perhaps not upside down with my nightgown over my face. Fast forward to the pandemic. I'm doing an online Qigong class in my son's backyard. This is the same one that was so contented as a baby. We're camping in his yard while they fix up our home. His chickens scratch and make happy hen sounds. As I breathe in and I breathe out, I'm moving as if I'm in the wind and water, or at least that's how I imagine that I'm moving. Hey, mom, my son says as he goes to collect the eggs. You know, things have worked out. My family's label as a hypochondriac is false. I have a diagnosis and a rheumatologist. They have better medicines now, ones that actually seem to work for me. And it turns out that my piriformis muscle was just fine the whole time. I know how to pronounce sacroiliac and costochondral, and I've learned not to be so hard on myself. Life is good. Hi, Jane. Hi. Thank you so much for being part of SEA Storytellers. Your story was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing it. Oh, you're welcome. So I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, so when you travel or camp or anything, how do you manage your AS when you're away from your home? Well, um, often I have to say, I wait until things start to hurt. And then, <laughs> then I realize, um, it's time to start exercising. So if we're not going for a hike or something, I actually bring a yoga mat in our camper. And I found that if you lay it on the picnic table, it's just the perfect size. And then I stand on the picnic table and I do, I do some moves. Like I have, um, I have an app and I can set my phone up just at the end of the table and I can do a little yoga routine or, um, something just to keep me moving. As everybody knows, it's just better to keep moving a little bit. 
So yeah, my hot pink yoga mat on the picnic table. Hardly anybody notices. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there was a, a such a touching uh, feel and tone to your story about what it was like to have AS years ago and then to sort of fast forward into the modern age of, of drugs and biologics and so on. Um, what, what advice would you give to someone who is newly diagnosed if they like what to do, you know, patients, like what would you say to someone? Oh, uh, so many things come to mind. Um, educate yourself. Mm -hmm. Educate yourself, because um, if you're like me, you'll get all sorts of advice from people who are well-meaning and well-intentioned. So it does require some patience. Um, and some of the uh, advice is going to be way off the wall. So um, to learn how to say, oh, thank you graciously. And I'll look into that or, oh, what an interesting idea. Um, educate yourself and and just keep moving and uh, stay the course, because there, there's more medicine in the pipeline and things are only just going to get better. Awesome. So one more question for you. Okay. Um, you talked about your caregiver support system a little bit, uh, your husband and your family. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Cause it's people love to hear, you know, stories about that. Oh, uh, well, my kids, um, they knew when things hurt that I was just going to lay on the couch some days, but um, really, uh, sometimes educating people who were providing me support, like a physical therapist, for example, uh, one in particular, he said, no, you don't want to turn too hard. And I said, I actually have to keep moving. And so the next time I came to visit, he had educated himself. And he said, oh, I see what you're talking about. So again, well, from my perspective, being educated is a, is a really good thing. And then I can talk to people without emotion um, about, well, not making it a dramatic thing, but explaining what I'm dealing with. Um, and then I'm comfortable in my own skin with the action that I'm taking. So that's Absolutely. kind of a roundabout answer, I think. <laughs> no, 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 it's right on. And your story does such a wonderful job um, showing you know, the various, I don't know, the stressors that this, this uh, disease can, can have. And I appreciate your honest, strong, educated voice. Uh, Thanks for all the terms. You handled them well. It's been such a pleasure having you on SAA Storytellers. Thank you so much for everything you do for SAA. And thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. And thanks to the SAA. Thank you, Sean. It's been fun. A big thank you to Jane for sharing her humorous and touching story and being part of SAA Storytellers. Our next storyteller is Zainab Abul Hassan. Zainab lives in Kuwait with her parents and siblings. She's a medical student at Kuwait University, hoping to train in rheumatology and help others with AS. At the age of 20, she was diagnosed with AS. She believes that AS has taught her and will keep teaching her a lot. Let's hear her story. Hello everyone, I'm Zainab Abul Hassan. I'm 21 years old and I'm a medical student at Kuwait University. Today, I'd like to share with you what's it like to have ankylosing spondylitis, or AS. Have you ever had that excruciating pain where you have to take a break and hit yourself to distract your brain from interpreting the pain? Well, that is exactly what has happened to me. Let me take you three years ago. It all started three years ago when I was experiencing mild discomfort in my lower back. It wasn't significant back then. However, it was getting worse and worse from then until last year. So just a couple of months ago, it was really unbearable and intolerable. So basically, the lower back pain would come and occur to me whenever I'd sit down and rest. And that is exactly what I do as a medical student. I'd be sitting down all the time and studying. And basically, another thing that makes the pain worse is stress. So these two components are definitely part of medical school. So whenever I sit down, attending a lecture or study, studying for, for a lecture, basically, I would start to twist in my seats, basically uh, trying to find a better, better position to alleviate the pain. But that doesn't actually work. Even one of my classmates once approached me and told me, Zainab, why do you move too much? You're distracting me. My rheumatologist even recommended me that I have to sit at the, at the, on the benches at the last or at the end of the lecture theater so that I don't distract my classmates. Anyways, twisting actually won't help me. The pain would persist and increase until it occupies my mind and distract me from studying. And then I have to take a break. 
The break involves me sitting down and crying, literally. My desk would become wet with my tears. So I have to remind myself later that I have to stop crying because that's not going to help me with the pain and that's not going to help me with studying either. And I remember once when we learned in psychology that if you ignore whatever is causing pain to you, you can actually reduce the intensity and the perception of, of, of the pain. I tried this for a couple of months, but it really didn't work. The pain was only getting worse. I really was helpless. I didn't know what to do. Um, I was um, basically, um, when I, other than the pain in my back, I also experienced pain in my heels. So whenever I take a, a walk with my parents, for example, I'd have to be a couple of meters behind them, trying to find a way to alleviate the pain in my heels. I literally had to tiptoe. That was really very painful. Um, apart from pain, I also suffered from fatigue and fever-like symptoms. Exactly how would you feel when you get common cold? Basically, all your body hurts you, you become hot, sweaty. This would happen to me almost daily. Um, having said that, I really envied my classmates who did not have to worry about pain or AS. All they had to worry about is just studying. While I had to worry about both studying and AS, and in fact, the chronic pain, even if it wasn't that intense, the fact that you expect it every day and you experience it literally every day makes you really irritated and agitated. So in my case, for example, after the diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis, I have been diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. So when I would have the abdominal pain and bloating, I would become very angry and irritated. I just cannot take it anymore. Back pain is more than enough for me. And so... Um, Basically, in the beginning, I didn't let my parents or my siblings know by, about the, my back pain because I didn't want them to be worried about me. And so that was an added stress because I had to go through all of this alone. So because of the stress and the pain, I would be angry, upset all the time. So when my parents would look at me, my mom, for example, would give me a long lecture on being positive and happy because she doesn't know what's exactly going inside me. From the outside, I do look normal, but from the inside, there's a lot going on. So having said that, do you know what makes matters worse? It's basically when people around you start to doubt you. I remember once my aunt told my mom right in front of me, don't you think that Zainab is exaggerating and that she's faking the pain? I looked at her and I told her, thank you, that was very supportive. But if that was all on my head, it wouldn't have been evident on the MRI. So thank you, but no thank you. So let's go to the diagnosis. The process of the diagnosis was really, really long. It, it took me three years, basically. So blood tests, x-rays, MRIs, bone scan, physical exam, and history. So it was very difficult. And I was like eager to know what is exactly going on. So the, room, the time comes when I'm at the rheumatology office, waiting really anxiously for a rheumat rheumatologist to tell me what's going on. He looks at me and he tells me, Zainab, you're going to take these injections. And he showed me something that looked like an insulin pen. I thought it is just steroids, something like that. I didn't know what that was. So I asked him, doctor, but what is the diagnosis in the first place? He looks at me, well, it's ankylosing spondylitis and this is biologic agent. I looked at him, a big pause here. What? Ankylosing spondylitis? You must be kidding. You're wrong. You must be wrong. I actually did tell him this, not because I don't trust him, but I found it difficult to believe the diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis, you know, especially as a medical student and as a future doctor. I thought, how is this going to influence my life? Is this like going to be a big barrier? I don't think I'm going to be able to continue. So, yeah, I actually denied the diagnosis of AS. And because of my denial, it's actually, I delayed the, the, receiving the treatment and that resulted in further damage. Now I even have erosion in the sacroiliac joints, thanks to my refusal. So at the end, I had to accept my diagnosis and I had to get the treatment. And so having said that, I can tell you now that thanks to my doctor, respectful, dear doctor, and the medication, I'm now able to sit for a longer time without having to switch on my, to twist on my seat, without having the pain consuming my mind. The mood swings are all gone. And I swear, just three weeks ago, I couldn't move my back as freely as I can now. So I can say that AS has pushed me to change my lifestyle a bit. I now have joined the gym and I swim every now and then. I'm more physically active and I'm trying my very best to be and to stay as calm as possible because stress means another flare and I'm, I'm not willing to have another flare. So at the end, I'd like to thank my rheumatologist. I'd like to thank my merciful doctor and finally my musculoskeletal radiologist because they all helped me to receive the diagnosis and the treatment. 
And in my case, I won't give up to AS. Um, I think I will let AS become my drive to achieving my dreams. And in fact, on the 23rd of September, I'm invited by Kuwait University to attend excellence ceremony. So what I'm trying to say here is that even with AS, it is doable. Go after your dreams and don't let anything let you down. And remember, you're not alone. Thank you. Hi, Zainab. Hi. How do you feel? Thanks for your story. I feel really good. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Hey, listen, you said something that I really want to follow up on, which I think a lot of people are going to identify with, and that is going to the gym. And did you go to the gym before your diagnosis? Actually, no. I was really very physically inactive. Um, after getting the diagnosis of AS and knowing the fact that physical activity improves the pain significantly, I decided that this is the time where I have to join the gym. And so really, it significantly changed my life. Uh, basically, going to the gym means that my joints are very, very happy. And, and, you know, you're such a ray of light and you're so friendly. And I've had so much fun, like, getting to know you. Um, and I know you talked about mood and pain and stress and all that. I just can't imagine you uh, having a bad mood. <laughs> How do you keep your mood up? So basically, it's not just one thing. It's a mix of things put together. Basically, um, I would, again, physical activity changed my mood a lot. And then also, I now know what's, what mix of medications I need to take in order to keep the pain down. And apart from this, it's just that you, if you embrace the diagnosis and you accept it, you'll be better. You, you'll get used to it, basically. I think it's just a mix. All right. Thank you so much for your uplifting and inspirational story. It's been great getting to know you. And thank you so much for being part of SAA Storytellers. Thank you very much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Many thanks to Zainab for sharing her personal story with such honesty and being part of this project. In addition to SAA Storytellers, we have other programs where you can connect with others, such as our support group program. If you'd like to learn more about our support groups, just click the link in the chat. Okay, our next storyteller is Juliana Coughlin. Juliana is a podcaster, a runner, and a Harry Potter nerd. She's a Hufflepuff. Her two podcasts, Puffcast, Your Harry Potter Happy Place, and Into the Fold, a Grishaverse podcast, are independently produced by herself and her two best friends. By day, she works as a dietitian for the VA, and when she's not walking her dog, podcasting, or talking Potter, she can be found running. She has run two Boston marathons and recently ran the Chicago Marathon this fall. Let's hear her story. When the Boston Marathon calls your name, you answer with a resounding, yes, ma'am. And the Boston Marathon called my name back in the spring of 2020. One. And by the Boston Marathon, I kind of mean my road race director called me and said, hey, do you want a spot in the Boston Marathon for the fall? And I said, um, yes, even though I was had been in quite a lot of pain for a while and my body was not in the best spot. But, you know, I'm stubborn and I definitely wanted to be a part of this amazing race for my second time around. And I was very determined and ambitious and ready to take on this challenge. So I created a very ambitious training plan for myself, something that probably was a little bit beyond where my physical limitations lied. And the physical limitations side of things is something that even now I'm still kind of learning about because I'm new to the chronic illness scene on the whole. It's been about two years so I have a good idea of what my body was like before I had AS and I created this very ambitious training plan and I had had some issues recently with my knees and one of my biggest fears about running a marathon is having to walk during part of it because to me that means that I personally am kind of giving up on myself if I'm walking but that's not necessarily true, but we'll touch a little bit more on that later. Fast forward a couple of months, I've done my training plan. It's been kind of tumultuous. It's not really been the best. Uh, 
<laughs> to say the least. And I've gone through way too much physical therapy, used way too much athletic tape, used way too many medications, so much stretching, so much Theragun time. Good Lord. It's, it's a lot. And I finally get to the day of the Boston Marathon. And let me tell you, the Boston Marathon is just running's love song to the world. It is just the most amazing, vibrant, passionate, just lovely day for running ever imaginable. The amount of joy that you can feel in the air from the spectators and the runners is just astounding. And that's why you run this marathon. It just makes you come alive as a runner and it's fabulous. And so I showed up the day of the Boston Marathon to the starting line with my friend Jen. And Jen is someone who has been part of my running club for a while. And she was also running. So we decided we would just run together. And we got to the starting line and I let her know like, hey, I haven't really been feeling too great recently. I'm having issues with my knees. I just want to let you know if you have to go ahead of me, that's fine. Feel free to chug ahead if that's what happens and I have to slow down or walk. And, oh, gosh, we don't want to walk. Ugh. Um, so she says, yep, sounds good. So we start running the Boston Marathon and the streets are just buzzing. They're buzzing with excitement from everyone and everywhere. And everything is going pretty much according to plan, which means, yes, my knees are in a lot of pain, but I haven't fully unhinged them yet. So we're good. And we get to around like mile 10. And then all of a sudden, I hear some kind of weird breathing pattern coming from my right. And I turn to see Jen not looking too hot. She definitely is breathing kind of funny and in a way that's not normal for her. And so I turn to her and I ask her if she's okay. And she looks at me with a face that says, before she even says anything, I'm not okay. And tells me that, hey, I think I might need to walk. And in this moment, I'm taken aback for a number of reasons. One, I don't really want to walk. And I have the choice of either sticking around with my friend and walking or chugging ahead and not having anyone to talk to, which as a runner, that's very important. You want to have friends to talk to priorities. So I made the decision in my head that in that moment, it was actually more important for me to stick around with her and one, make sure she's okay. And two, just have my talking buddy with me for the rest of the race, hopefully, then to not walk. And also that I wasn't the one making us, quote unquote, walk. I thought I was going to be the one who was going to be the slowdown or who was going to be the one walking because I'm, I'm the one who's sick. I'm the one who has all these issues with my legs and my knees. And all of a sudden the tables are turned on me and I'm the one who's okay. So just kind of a lot to process in one moment, but it actually came down to the fact that I walked and we walked for a little bit because she definitely needed to regain her breath and get some fluid and get some fuel. And guess what? The world didn't explode. Everything was fine. The gods of not walking did not come and strike me into the pavement. It was okay. <laughs> and so we got past that moment and she was feeling a little bit better. So we began running again and around mile 17 to 18, the breathing thing started happening again. And this whole time my knees had been in pain, but pretty stably in pain. And again, not unhinged. So we call that a win. And she decided that she really needed to walk around mile 18 and she needed to walk for a good portion of time and told me, go ahead, have fun, enjoy the rest of the race. I'll meet you at the end. And with that, I said, okay. And 
the rest of the way, I just really embrace the joy that is the Boston Marathon because it's a block party. It's a fun time. Yes, there are people like drinking. They start at like 8 a.m. It's pretty funny, actually, sometimes. And you have like little kids on trampolines. You have the scream tunnel of all these girls just screaming at you to run as fast as you can. You have this really cute dog who's at mile two who's just waiting to say hello to you whose name is Henry. I saw Santa Claus and I told him my wish was that I would finish the Boston Marathon. And guess what? He granted it because... The rest of the way to the finish line, I just smiled my way to the end and really embraced the joy that is the Boston Marathon. And I took that joy and I crossed the finish line. And as I was crossing the finish line, I realized a few things that one, of course, I had done it. I was I, I finished the Boston Marathon for my second time and for my time where I had the least amount of confidence in my body and in myself Two, my body hadn't like failed me or anything it was pretty stable and again i i finished i was okay and three that it's okay if you walk in the boston marathon hi juliana hello Hello. hi sean how are you i'm great thank you so much for being on saa storytellers and sharing your amazing story yeah, well, thank you guys for having me. Like, this is such an honor. So I have a few questions for you. Um, so I know you travel a lot, and you were also talking about your knees in the marathon story. So how do you mm. take care of your knees when you travel? Yeah, so a lot of it's just finding the right medications that you need and just figuring out what works for your body. I know for me personally, when I was just traveling to Europe and back, One of the things that really saved me was my muscle relaxant. And it just, it gave me just enough like elasticity in my, in my joints where I didn't wake, I didn't like get out of the plane and feel like my body was going to break into two, which is what happened uh, prior to me starting that. So uh, that, and also just getting up and stretching and moving and knowing like, Hey, I, I've reached that point in the day where my body is feeling a certain way that I know that if I keep pushing it, it's not going to end well for me. And I need to do like X, Y, and Z, which would be like stretching or stopping or sitting or whatever to be able to travel as a one piece package instead of breaking your body into multiple pieces. You know, your story was so surprising when you first shared it with me because living with AS, you actually were helping someone else that had some other condition going on. And the the surprise is, you know, you're not the you weren't the one slowing down the Boston Marathon. So it was so interesting and empowering to hear this story, how you know you've got your AS uh, under control and managed and you were in good enough shape to help someone else, which is so touching. Yeah, no, that was definitely a really interesting experience, too, because what ended up happening was some kind of like heart related issue that she didn't even know she had. Like she had no idea she had this issue even going into the marathon. And it's after this afterwards, the doctor was like, yeah, you probably shouldn't have finished like, but she finished anyway. But uh, yeah, it was interesting that me, the person who knew that I had an issue coming in ended up being kind of the one who finished the strongest, I guess, in a way. Absolutely. It was wild. wild. Absolutely. So tell me, um, switching gears a little bit, tell me a little bit about your podcast. Yeah. So I actually have two podcasts, but my, my main one is a Harry Potter based podcast uh, where me and my best friend talk about all things Harry Potter related. And we are just two big old nerds geeking out over Harry Potter. And we actually just recently went to, as you saw, the Harry Potter studio tour together Mm -hmm. in London, which was so cool. I had never been there before. And they have all the original set pieces from the movies there because that's the exact same lot where they filmed all eight of the movies on. Um, It's very cool. I cried a lot. Those movies and those books mean a lot to me. Uh, But, oh, my God, so, so fun. But, yeah, if if anyone out there is into Harry Potter, uh, my podcast is called Puffcast, which is because we're two Hufflepuffs, which is one of the Hogwarts houses. Um, And we, we call it your Harry Potter happy place. So it's just a fun, inviting 
uh, conversation and environment where we want everyone to feel welcome and like they can just join in and have some fun. Wonderful. And thank you for saying the name of your podcast. I was about to say it. Uh, we will also put a link in the chat so yeah. people can uh, follow along. And Juliana, I can't thank you enough for being on SEA Storytellers and sharing your story and telling us a little bit about, more about yourself. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you and I've learned a lot. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you guys for having me. It's such a nice thing to have such a great platform to talk about having all versions of AS. Yeah. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Yeah, thank you. You too. A big thank you to Juliana for sharing her personal story with such honesty and humor. If you would like to follow Juliana on social media, just click on the links in the chat. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight. I hope you're enjoying these great storytellers. If you'd like to learn more about SAA Storytellers, Your Stories on Stage, and join us as a storyteller for a future show, just click the link in the chat. Okay. Our next storyteller is Denise Roy. Denise and her husband have been married for 42 years. And after eight years of traveling between New Hampshire and Florida, they are now full-time Florida residents. Fly fishing and hiking are her two great passions, taking annual fishing trips off the grid every spring and fall. She began hiking in the White Mountains of New Hampshire eight years ago after her diagnosis. And she hikes with a group that is called the Not So Perky Peaks, Five Amazing Women, a Sisterhood of Love and Support. She's also had a 34-year career as an elementary school art teacher and athletic director, where she coached and refereed every sport. Her new activities include volunteering each summer at a local library to facilitate art activities for kids. Let's hear Denise's story. Hi, uh, my name is Denise, and I am grateful to be able to share part of my AS story with you. Uh, I grew up in a small paper mill town in northern New Hampshire, about an hour from the Canadian border, where I lived across the street from my grandparents until I was about 18 years old. Every load of wood going to our paper mill from points north traveled right past our houses, um, either by the busy road or the railroad tracks. So I learned very early on to navigate my way to my grandmother's house. My earliest memories of my grandmother's physical condition comes from maybe back into my early teens. I watched this woman go from a force to be reckoned with to a shell of herself. She was a hardworking woman from the depression who had begun this strange and constant state of physical decline. She had raised four sons. She helped run a restaurant. She managed two apartment buildings and our summer cottage. She was a strong swimmer and an amazing cook, and she would want me to tell you that she kept an immaculate house. In the blink of an eye, she became crooked, then she was hunched over. I saw her go from a cane to a walker, to a chair, and finally bedridden, passing at the age of 79, severely disfigured and shrunken and disformed. In the process, my grandmother changed. She wasn't fun anymore. She couldn't do anything without complaining. She was very cranky. And then there came the screams of agony from the sheer pain she was in. However, we relentlessly teased her over those years, kind of poked the bear whenever we had a chance. I remember my grandfather would help my grandmother to bed, give her something, close the door and walk away. This was when you could call your doctor and get any kind of script you wanted. And it was also the days of house calls, where the doc came with his big black bag full of not sure what. We didn't know what was wrong with her, if there was anything at all. There were no tests back then. There was no treatment for her. So my grandmother was literally at the mercy of my grandfather to treat her as he saw fit. According to my dad, my grandfather wasn't very nice to my grandmother over those years. Family members started to stay away more and more. Issues began to surface. My grandmother wasn't invited to one of her granddaughter's weddings because everybody was afraid that she would have an episode or she would steal all the thunder. She was openly perceived as a hypochondriac. Even when 
things became visibly apparent that there was something not okay with the mayor. Memories like these continue to pop up like old snapshots of how I was becoming my grandmother. I believe seeing her rapid deterioration combined with how she was treated had an overwhelming impact on me and how I dealt with realizing I was becoming my grandmother. It planted seeds in my head, which would come back to bite me in the butt time and time again. Like me, her problems came and went for many years, beginning with nagging back issues to attacking different parts of her body. It truly was and is always something. And it's invisible until it's too late. I became a master at adapting, at recovering and hiding it from everybody, including my husband, Gary. However, I have come to know the hard way that this is the kind of journey that requires an amazing and supportive partner willing to deal with it for the long haul. It's not a fun ride, but support makes it easier. I am haunted, though, by the thought that I can't be the partner that I want to be, the partner that Gary deserves, but he continues to take on more and more without any complaining, and he's still here. You might not believe this, but I can be a bit of a handful at times. This is not to say that we don't struggle, but together we continue to manage the best we can, and we have a really good life. This journey will also take a good chosen family, your friends. I am very lucky to have amazing friends who want to understand and make sure that I still feel like I'm part of the tribe. I was and still am terrified of what this will do to me physically, but the invasive seeds of insecurity and lack of trust kept me from leaning on others or asking for any help. A little bit to this day. How could I trust these people? I saw what they were capable of. I saw what they weren't capable of. To this day, my parents simply do not understand this. They never ask, and I don't say. It's just easier that way. But there's never an end of insensitive comments uh, coming from family. Like my mother, for instance, her favorite one is to tell me that she looks and feels is in, and is in better shape than I am. She's 87 years old. So it seems that I'm the third generation of four um, with AS. After 35 years of searching for answers, at the age of 52, I was finally diagnosed with AS and other related issues. I have two sisters, as well as my 17-year-old niece, who are all HLA B12 positive and have AS markers. I also have a 40-year-old female cousin whose parents don't want her to know anything about this. Because you see, like my grandmother and like me, she has an array of physical issues, beginning with back issues, and is already perceived as a hypochondriac. I think she is becoming my grandmother, too. My disease has significantly progressed over the past couple of years. Yes, I am my grandmother. There's no denying it. And life is a far cry from when I really enjoyed to burn the candle at both ends. But I worked hard and I played even harder. I think I always knew that it will all come to an end sooner rather than later. As far as the toll on my mental health, I will say that I am very aware of the changes. What caused this for me was the growing list of things that I could no longer do. The things that made me feel whole, that brought joy to me, all crumbled. For me, it was like a perpetual state of mourning, filled with denial, and anger, loneliness, um, depression, until finally actual acceptance. Acceptance is what has allowed me to be realistic in the decisions that have to be made, in the treatments, and it also allows me to find joy in new things, to move on. I don't believe in tooth fairies or unicorns. I'm way too busy fighting the dragon but I still enjoy a walk in the woods along the river and I appreciate the healing properties that it still gives me. One thing I do wish is I wish I could talk to my grandmother now. I would like to tell her that I know, I believe you, and I'm sorry that this disease ravished you and your family wasn't there to support you. So just because I've become my grandmother does not mean that I'm like her in every way just the important ones. So thank you for letting me share my story. I wish you nothing but the best. Be well.
Hi, Denise. How are you doing, Sean? Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing this story on SAA Storytellers. How do you feel? I feel good. As I told you, this is the first time that I share this story publicly um, and to this degree. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a really um, comforting thing to know that I'm not alone. Absolutely. And thanks so much for touching on the generational aspects and also the invisibility and having to trust people. I mean, you, you sort of hit on everything. Um, I have a question for you. So tell me about these walks in the forest. Um, what do you do to prepare? Do you use poles? Like, how do you get through these walks in a way that you feel safe and you can really enjoy them? Well, the walks have gone through a tremendous transformation over the years. Um, so they've gone from, you know, being able to get above tree line to, you know, staying down on the lower lands. But we choose um, trails that are not too treacherous. And we go until I can't go. And then we turn around and come back and try it again the following week. Uh, how, how many times a week do you do this? Um, once a week, I have a group of five women friends who have, um, started this little club about eight years ago, and we kind of hold each other's hands through the various things that we go through. Are you the only one with AS in the group? I am, but mm -hmm. there's a plethora of, um, things that we all deal with. So we, ha we all have something. <laughs> You know, something. So I have one more question because I, I just I love the, the walking in the forest stuff. Um, what do you do for footwear? Do you have something that you feel comfortable in? Um, at this point, I still walk pretty good. I don't mm -hmm. care. My friends will carry my water and whatever else I carry with me. And I just am very aware of, you know, where I put my feet. And, you know, it's one foot in front of the other is, is all I do. Absolutely. Um, I, one more question. So your moment at the end of your story, like giving it to your grandmother, you know, and just saying, you know, here it is. Here's my story. Um, what do you think she would say back to you, like being so visible with this disease now? Like and the world has changed a lot. Right. So like what do you how do you what do you think she would say today? You know, my grandmother was a. Uh... A, a, like I said, a force to be reckoned with. So I think she would tell me, you keep fighting the fight, lady. Mm -hmm. In French, though. <laughs> really? In, oh, yeah, in French. Yes. Oh. I love your story, and I have had such a great time working with you. Thank you for coming to me and trusting me to guide, you know, guide you through drafts and talk through this and meet with me online. Uh, it's so great to be in touch, and you've made my life better. So thank you so much for doing this. It's been my pleasure, and it's been great meeting you, Sean. So thank you very much. And my exposure to your organization has been so far just a fabulous opportunity. Yay! Thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Bye now. Big thanks to Denise for sharing her touching story, and thanks for being part of SAA Storytellers. I want to share that SAA doesn't receive any government funding and relies on private donations. Funds received help sustain programs like our National Support Group Program. I'll put a link in the chat to our donation page if you'd like to help SAA fulfill its mission. You can also volunteer, give a gift in memory or tribute, and there are just so many ways to support us at SAA. Okay, we are ready to introduce the final storyteller of the night, Mary Cork. Mary loves being active, being social, and eating. Luckily for her, all those activities go together very well. She keeps busy with walking, hiking, swimming, playing pickleball, and she loves all winter sports, skiing, cross-country skiing, and ice skating. But most of all, she enjoys her growing family, her spouse, her kids, their spouses, her grandkids, and as you will see, others who have joined her family along the way. Her clan is getting quite big. Her diagnosis is NRXPA, and she's just over two years into treatment, and even though she knows she's had this disease for decades, Mary ignored her symptoms for most of her life, despite her sister being diagnosed in her early 30s. Mary says, it's so great that I let her lead the way. She figured it all out, and by the time I got to the point where I couldn't move, she had all the answers. That's what sisters are for. Let's hear Mary's story.
My family took in two people from a country where same-sex marriage is illegal. The boys came to the U.S. for freedom and could stay because one of them had U.S. citizenship through his father. They ended up living in cramped quarters in our basement. They were happy, hopeful, and so much fun. We all loved them from the start. Skip forward three months. The boys are still in the basement. They've decided to get married because they can. I am excited and offered to host a small reception, cake and champagne. The boys are thinking huge. They love the US, a country that has accepted them for being gay, where everyone is happy for them. The guest list is already up to 50 people and the wedding is no longer a civil ceremony and cake after. They want a real American wedding and have already arranged for a photographer, a caterer, a red velvet cake and a flower girl. And it's going to happen in our home in three weeks. The boys are now family. Separately, each has asked me to walk him down the aisle and together they asked me to give a toast at the reception. The details are falling in place. Because my husband and I had just moved, we have a huge room still empty to host the ceremony and another room, almost empty, that will be perfect for dancing afterwards. Having hosted weddings for our three other children, I am organized so organized that the Sunday before, I go wine tasting with a friend. Wine and I do not get along. I wine taste Sunday and Monday, I feel pretty bad. I sip tea all day, trying to rehydrate. Tuesday, I feel worse. Now I cannot keep anything down. I tell my husband I need to go see a doctor. Here's the thing you need to know. I truly do not like doctors. I don't like people poking at me. I find waiting rooms intrusive. I've managed my own personal health journey, mostly by denying and negotiating with doctors sometimes shaming me to get me to accept treatment. At urgent care, I get one IV and then another. My body sucks up the fluid, but I end up feeling worse rather than better. Now I'm shaky and dizzy. Blood tests show that my sodium levels are dangerously low and I need to go to a hospital. At the hospital, the ER doctor says I need to be admitted. I stiffen, I argue. To be honest, he says, you qualify for the ICU. Now I panic. I have watched way too many TV shows and I know that ICU means being intubated and possibly even shot. I beg the doctor, any place but the ICU, I feel I will truly die if I end up there. He agrees and I'm wheeled off to a department I didn't even know existed, geriatrics. I'm taken to a cavernous room with a bed in the middle and benches all around. That's where the children and grandchildren must sit while they're saying their last goodbyes. And my doctor arrives, Dr. Palliative Care, the kind of doctor who helps you die. Dr. Palliative Care is nice though. He explains they will fix my sodium and I will go home. I'm attached to an IV drip of some kind and a heart monitor and another port catheter thing just because. The boys hear the news and are not staying calm. They want to cancel the wedding. Mary's health is more important than our wedding, they tell everyone, but I am adamant. I already have a diagnosis and a treatment. The wedding can go on. The next morning, Wednesday, Dr. Palliavish Care shows up again. I tell him I'm better. I'm ready for discharge. He says I'm not ready and disappears. I don't even have time to negotiate. The hospital staff avoids me, except for my nurse. It is mostly just me in this huge cavernous room with empty benches and tubes and beeping machines. Thursday morning, Dr. Kelly Palliative Care doesn't show up at all. I pepper my nurse with questions. Why am I still here? He tells me it takes at least two days to con to correct a sodium issue. Anything quicker can set off a cardiac event. I tell him I feel good. Actually, he says, 
your sodium levels were among the lowest, well, honestly, the lowest levels I've ever seen, at least in a person who was still living. Shoot, my anxiety is out of control. I explain I need to get home, that I have two sons marrying each other the next night and I am hosting the wedding. The nurse is confused about the two sons, but takes down notes. He says he will pass on the message. Later, he returns with a message from Dr. Palliative Care. He says, I absolutely will go home on Friday in time for the wedding. Friday morning, I am beside myself, but slowly I'm taking off monitors and drips, and finally my doctor arrives. He explains my sodium was low because of a medicine my other doctor put me on to try to remineralize my bones. This is before I was diagnosed and my spine was in trouble, although no one seemed to know why. The drug increases calcium by decreasing sodium. He explains I'm healthy, the healthiest patient he's ever dealt with. I need to remind you, most of his patients are actively dying. I hope I'm healthy compared to them. Now his words, go home and enjoy the wedding. I get out of that hospital as fast as I can. I arrive home where the house is already a flurry of activity. Lights are being strung, food is being delivered, flowers are being arranged. I fly up to my room and I cut off the hospital bracelets. Then I step in the shower and take my time scrubbing all the adhesive off from these sensors that were attached to my body. I put on my fabulous dress, calm the grooms, and walk them each separately down the aisle. And I cry with everyone else at the most touching, beautiful wedding ever. Beautiful because it almost never happened. These two men had to safely flee their country and find safety with our family. Then I had to be strong enough to accept treatment, even though it was a hard thing for me to do. After the ceremony, it is time for the fun to start I stand on a chair and raise my glass of champagne to toast my two favorite boys, my two newest sons, and I'm careful only to have a sip or two of champagne. That was wonderful, Mary. Thank you so much for being on SAA Storytellers. Well, thank you. This has been fun. So I was happy to share my story. <laughs> How do you feel? Uh, about the story? or Yeah, about, about telling the story and everything. Yeah. Well, so this happened, you know, before the pandemic. But mm -hmm. um, this little bit of joy in our life has really been kind of fun. And uh, it's it's fun to relive it. So, yeah, that's been it's been a really good thing. So. I, I, I was so incredibly touched by your story, every single angle of it. And I'm so excited that you brought it to us and you were willing to share it because I think people are going to really enjoy hearing it. Thanks. Thanks. So I have one little question for you. So what do you do to take care of yourself? Like, you know, to make sure you're healthy and can stretch and, you know, bend over and all that stuff. What, what kind of uh, self-care do you do? Um. Well, the best thing for me is walking. Um, I have one really good friend and uh, when we can, we walk for a good hour and a half and it's good for two reasons. Uh, one, just the walking is good, but um, we also get on some deep subjects and I do believe that anything I can do to relieve my stress is also helpful. So um, we kind of work through things. It's free therapy both ways, so. <laughs> Gosh, that's any, do you like um, mountains or parks or? Uh, well, uh, we, right now we're in an urban area. So uh, we walk, uh, it's pretty urban, but um, yes, I do in the summer. I like to, we go up to Vermont and I like to hike. Uh, they call them mountains. They're a little smaller, but um, yeah, just keep walking. That's what awesome. I do. Awesome. Yeah. Do you, do you use walking poles at all? I'm just curious. No, actually, no. no? Um, I personally, uh, you know, my husband does going down hills. Um, I want to keep my core as strong as I can. And so I'm in my balance. So um, I consider that an aid and I don't need it. So I don't use them. <laughs> Got it. Well, I am so grateful that you took the time to work on your story and share it on SCA Storytellers. 
I am so grateful for you. And thank you, thank you, thank you for, uh, for doing this. No, thank you. And you've been a great coach. And so it's been fun all around. So, but yes, awesome. for me, this has been uh, just sharing a bit of my life. And um, it's, it's been nice to just put myself out there just a bit. So thank you. You're welcome. I love it. It's great to know you better. Thanks yeah. again. A heartfelt thank you to Mary. Thanks so much for meeting with me to share your story and being part of this project. What a wonderful group of storytellers. Jane Morrill, Zainab Abul Hassan, Juliana Coughlin, Denise Roy, and Mary Cork. Thank you. Thank you so much for being brave and sharing your personal journey with us. If you would like to join the next SAA Storytellers, Your Stories on Stage presentation, I'll put a link in the chat so you can save the date now with a virtual ticket. Thank you so much for helping us create community and empathy through the power of story. I love, 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 love storytelling, and it is a pleasure to share my passion for it with you tonight. Also, another big thank you to Lily for helping us make this space possible. I hope you will consider telling a story with SAA. Thank you for joining us this evening. Have a great night.